Hi everybody and welcome to Scuba Diver Magazine, the best place for your scuba diving entertainment and information. Um, so scuba diving, you know, usually takes place in the water and seven tenths of our blue planet is covered in water. So there are a lot of dive sites that you can enjoy, um, but there are also a lot that you can't surface swim to from the shore. There's often a lot of amazing dive sites out there, out in the open ocean that you just have zero chance of reaching by just using your little old legs. Whilst diving along shorelines can be a great way to see some amazing reefs, you can't actually venture too far from shore and you have to of course carry all of your gear to and from the water and they're not always the easiest places to get to to reach by road anyway. Aha, uh -huh. but Mark, boats exist, I hear you say. That is true, but there are different grades of boats. A little rib will get you so far from the shore, and they're nice and nippy to get you into those tight little spots, but they're also not made for comfort um, or long journeys neither, and they really don't have the storage space for any amount of gear. Day boats are an upgrade on uh, on tiny little ribs. Um, they have much more space on them and they have a much better range, but as their name suggests, they only really head out for the day. And this will be what you dive off on uh, sort of many dive holidays, just a day boat. You'll stay in a hotel and then in the morning, you'll head out on a day boat for your day's diving. However, there also exists bigger boats um, built purely for scuba diving that are basically floating hotels with a dive center on board. These are liverboards. And as their name suggests, you live aboard them um, for your entire dive holiday, or at least the majority of it, and they have a lot of benefits. But if you're new to diving or you've just never really been on a liverboard, there are some things that you should really should know about them. So let's dive in. One of the biggest draws about liverboards is their pure focus on scuba diving. On other dive trips, you'll go out on a day boat and make two, maybe three dives before heading back, taking your kit off and then you head back to your hotel. On a liverboard, your dive boat is the hotel, so there's a lot less of carrying your gear backwards and forwards. Liverboards have a greater range compared to a day boats because they don't have to return to port every single day, and this means that they can get to certain dive sites earlier than day boats, so popular dive sites are much less busy. The Thistlegorm in the Red Sea is the best example for this. The Thistlegorm is on pretty much every single top 10 dive list out there as one of the best wreck dives on the planet. But if we look at where Thistlegorm is on the map, and then we compare that to where most dive centers are in Sharm El Sheikh, it's a pretty long way to travel by day boat. So most liverboards will make their way to the Thistlegorm, they'll moor up to it at night or during the afternoon the day beforehand, and then you dive it first thing in the morning with only a handful of other scuba divers. You then dive it again later that same day for dive two so that you can explore a different section. And then when you're taking your time, you're having a nice drink in the mid afternoon, you cast your eyes over to the horizon and see a fleet of day boats who all sort of uh, set off at around 5 a.m. in the morning and they're only now just arriving. Your third dive on Thistlegorm in the afternoon is a different experience. With all of those extra scuba divers, the ocean around Thistlegorm is now carbonated with all the bubbles and you often have to wait your turn to literally make a move. You can do a night dive on the Thistlegorm after all of the day boats have set sail and head back home, so you have plenty more time to enjoy the stunning wreck. Liverboards are a much more civilized way to dive. On a day boat, you need to change your tanks between every dive, so you have to break all of your kit down, find a fresh tank, move it around, set up all your kit up again onto your brand new tank because day boats will hold, uh, they'll carry multiple tanks, one for every diver for each dive. Liverboards will allocate you a single tank for your entire week's diving. So all you have to do after the scuba dive is just take your regulators off. 
Whilst you're having lunch, one of the wonderful crew will be topping up your cylinder with some nice fresh air or night trucks. All you need to do is just fit your regulators and uh, then you're ready to go diving again. Liverballs are also a great way to rack up your dive count. It won't be unusual for you to run four dives in a single day. So 20 dives on one week's trip is a real achievable target. And it won't be the same four dive sites over and over again. Uh, it'll almost be a brand new dive site for each dive. Or if it's an intricate dive site or a wreck like the Thistlegorm, then you'll dive one section and then another section on another dive. So you're spreading it out and it never gets boring. Liverboards can also have some perks. Some boats will offer something like free nitrox for the week. Uh, others may have photography workshops aboard so you can work on your camera. Uh, and you can also complete some dive courses on some boards too. You also usually have a pair of dive guides on boats and, uh, and they will be instructors that can teach you some continuing education during your trip. So if you wanted to do your nitrox course or another speciality, then you can. It obviously depends on the boat and the itinerary, uh, but you can sign up for courses on board to expand your knowledge and become a better scuba diver. You'll also be given the choice of a guided tour, or you can just go off and do your own thing in the water, just as long as you're back at the boat at a certain time. Personally, I quite enjoy a guided tour. The guides, they'll show you around, but they know the dive sites like the back of their hands, and they have keen eyes, so they know what to look for in certain areas, and they know where interesting critters usually hang out. But what should you think about before you sign up to a liverboard? Liverboards usually have skill requirements because the diving involved is usually a bit more demanding or may require a certain level of confidence. They'll usually require you to be advanced open water with 60 dives under your belt because you'll be reaching certain dive sites that can be more demanding and if something goes wrong, you're a lot further from medical care so they of course want everybody on board to be competent. For example, it won't be unusual to make a lot of your dives from a small rib because the large liverboard just can't get in close to certain reefs in any current. So be expected to perform some negative entries maybe from a rib. Um, around some reefs there can be a lot of current at the surface so you need to get down as quickly as possible to avoid being swept away in that current. So you need to be happy that you have all of your dive gear and you are ready to start swimming down as soon as you hit the water. The same goes for getting out at the end of the dive. A lot of the time you have to climb back out onto a rib. The boat handlers will help you out, but it's mainly up to you. After the first night, you will usually be spending the entire week out at sea. So if you have any allergies or sort of food intolerances, or you just don't like something, then of course, let them know as early as possible. They can't just pop out to the local grocery store to pick up a few bits for you. That being said, the chefs and cooks on board are stunning in what they can make in such little space. I've been on a dive boat where someone has announced it's their birthday on like day four of the trip, so you're out in the open ocean, and that very night, they've actually whipped up a three-tier chocolate cake. They are just stunning in what they can do, and, um, and they will change their menus to your requirements. Just give them enough kind of notice beforehand so that they can get enough sort of supplies in at the beginning of the week. It's assumed that you pretty much have all of your dive equipment, but if you do need to borrow anything, then let them know early because they won't have too many spares on board. They will supply you with a tank and some lead. Everything else is kind of up to you to either bring yourself, bring your own gear, or to rent. Liverboards will have a week's diving planned out, but there's usually a theme to it. Um, so that you'll get something that's northern wrecks and reefs in the Red Sea, which has kind of a mixture of both wrecks and reefs, funnily enough. Um, you'll get something that's more wreck focused, uh, like get wrecked. Um, that's gonna focus pretty purely on shipwrecks. You might have the odd uh, kind of reef dive just to fill in um, some afternoons, but it's gonna be 
pretty rec centric um, simply the best there's all sorts of different itineraries the itinerary is what the trip will be focused on so if you don't like shipwrecks then stay off something called the best of wrecks try and look sort of when you're trying to book the trip at which itinerary kind of suits what you're looking for but what's day-to-day -day life actually like on a liverboard when you arrive, after making your way through the airport and to the liverboard itself, you'll carry your bags on board, but try to leave your dive kit on the dive deck. There's no sense carrying it any further because you're just gonna be bringing it straight back fairly soon. So the first thing is, is that you'll meet up with your dive guides and some of the crew, and they'll go through the usual paperwork, so liability release forms, self-assessment medical questionnaires, and they'll be checking your cert cards, so get them out ready. At this point, you'll be told which cabin is yours if you haven't already and of course who you'll be bunking with because they're usually two person bed uh, not beds rooms <laughs> that would be awkward um, while everybody is doing their paperwork everyone else is usually making themselves at home and setting up their gear on a tank so you usually do this fairly early on and tank choice is actually quite an important choice and it determines where you're going to be kitting up for the rest of the week so choose wisely um, personally I like to pick a tank that's on the end of a row just because you usually get a bit more space to kit up there's not a person on both sides of you um, and it's usually Usually, uh, sort of nice to be next to or at least nearby to your buddy as well. The first night is usually spent in port. They usually don't sort of head out until the following day. This kind of gives the crew time to restock everything and get the boat ready for the week ahead. Um, it gives them time to get any rental gear if you've asked for it. Um, they'll go to the dive center that night and then sort of bring it in or uh, they may need to uh, sort of get some specialist food in for somebody. You'll get the usual safety briefing um, and a kind of rundown of the boat and sort of how things tend to run um, with your uh, sort of first meal. It'll be at dinner time and then they'll just sort of run through all the do's and don'ts and where things are. Your first proper day um, depends on the itinerary, but it will usually start pretty early on in the day. Days on board usually start at about 6 a.m. with a knock on your door. Uh, but on your very first day, you might get a lay in if you're lucky, but no promises there. Your first dive is highly recommended and it's pretty much obligatory uh, because it will be your check dive. So when you wake up, there'll be a dive briefing and soon after that, your first dive of the trip. It'll be a fairly basic dive, somewhere with no current, a nice sandy bottom, um, just somewhere safe where you can kind of settle yourself and make sure that all of your gear is kind of working properly. It's at this point where the dive guys will be watching you all and uh, checking you over to see kind of what level of dive you all are so they know where they can take you on some dives. If they see a lot of the group is a bit novice, um, they might take it a bit more uh, sort of safer routes. Um, but if they see that you're a bit more advanced, then they might take a, um, a more, not risky, but a more exciting route. After that, your days become quite Pavlovian because you will be introduced to the ship's bell or some kind of ring device um, the bell will ring before food and before a dive and they usually alternate between the two so the first bell will mean that there's a dive briefing of the day uh, the next bell means that it's breakfast your next bell is your second dive then the bell is lunch and then the third dive dinner and then maybe a night dive your first couple of days you tend to find your groove and um, how you like to do things, where you like to sit, uh, but the next few days, the kind of day two, three, four, um, they just disappear, I promise you that. So enjoy them and don't let them go too quickly. Now, as I said earlier, days start pretty early, but you don't need to do all of the dives if you do want a lion. Um, but while you're there, you kind of feel that you really should make the most of it. But if you're feeling pretty tired, you don't have to do any dives. It's just make sure that the dive guide knows so that they know that you're not jumping in the water because at the end of the dive and you're not getting out, they're going to panic. So tell them if you're not going to make a certain dive well beforehand. As far as food, breakfast is usually some kind of continental breakfast and your choice of omelettes with tea or coffee and the usual drinks. Uh, lunch will be a bit more sort of local food, buffet style bits, rice and salads, cooked meats, just kind of bits and bobs. And dinner is usually a bit more substantial, but it's a similar kind of buffet style. Grab what you want, leave what you don't, and uh, there's often some kind of dessert. 
Drinks on board, you'll usually have a whole bunch of water coolers uh, on each deck and there will be mini fridges dotted around the place. Um, at the start of the trip, try and find a bottle of water. They're usually littered all over the place um, and write your name on it uh, with a pen. You can then reuse it and fill it up at the water coolers and then you can keep it cool in a fridge uh, when you're not drinking from it. You usually have fizzy drinks in the fridge too. It depends on the boat, uh, but they're often included. There will be beers and the odd spirit around too, but these you usually have to pay for. Uh, sort of whatever you drink, you mark it down and then at the end of the week you end up paying for it. But remember that alcohol and scuba diving really don't mix, so try to limit your alcohol consumption on liverboards. Bedtime is really any time after dinner or just any time midday whenever you feel tired. Um, and um, yeah, many tend to stay up and chat until the early hours. Personally, I don't function very well without my beauty sleep. Um, so I tend to ex uh, excuse myself fairly early on and uh, sort of head to my cabin when I start to feel a bit sleepy. Um, others prefer to bring their pillows and duvet to the top deck and actually sleep up there, which is quite a good idea. Um, you don't tend to find any insects out on the liverboard because you're, you're out at sea, you don't find many bugs out there. Um, there's usually a nice breeze too, and it's often less stuffy uh, than down below decks. So let's talk about what it's actually like to dive on a liverboard. Dives on board usually go like this. The bell will ring, everybody assembles in a selected spot and they get themselves comfortable. Uh, one or two or all of the dive guys will show you a map of the dive site and the route that they are going to take. Uh, they also tell you a little something about the dive site, so how it got its name or what species you would likely see down there. Um, if it's a shipwreck, a little something about uh, sort of what the ship was and how it sank. And, and you'll often be split into two groups just to make kitting up a little bit easier so you have more space. You don't have everybody just cramming in trying to get kitted up. It's, uh, it just sort of gives everyone a bit more space. Um, if you're diving on nitrox, there will be an analyzer somewhere and a log book where you fill out your mix and your MOD and you just sort of sign it. If you're diving from the back of the boat it's all pretty easy. Just kit up, go through your buddy checks and uh, in you go really. Um, if you're diving from a rib you kit up except for your fins, just grab hold of those. You then climb down into the rib, they'll help you out uh, because it's a little bit uh, sort of uh, awkward and, um, and when you're actually in the rib then put your fins on. Uh, I tend to do it fairly early on just so it's sort of out of the way because you're not going to be moving around too much much. When you do actually step into the rib, try and be as even as possible and um, and as far back as possible. If everybody gets onto the same side, the left hand side for example, then the, it can literally be too much weight on one side and it can tip over. Um, and too much weight at the front, it just means that the rib doesn't cut through the water so well. So try and make it equal so there are equal numbers on both sides of the rib and scooch back as uh, sort of much as you can whilst you're sort of making your way uh, to the dive site. The rib will then sort of buzz you to the entry point. Um, there'll be a rope handle along the side of the tender, kind of where you're sitting to, uh, to hold on to, just to stop you from sliding around. Uh, when you actually reach the entry point, get yourself ready, put your mask on, all that kind of stuff, regulators, and make sure you have uh, sort of as much space between you, either side of you as possible, because you are all gonna be rolling back at the same time. The boat handler will give everyone a three count and uh, and on their go, everybody makes a rollback entry at the same time. So just kind of scoot your bum back as far as you can and, uh, and just sort of sit upright and lean backwards when you're ready. As soon as you hit the water, swim away from the rib because the rib may need to move away from the reef and do your best to just go in a straight line backwards so you don't, you know, kick everyone around you. The boat handler, they'll stick around for a little while just to make sure that everyone's okay and they're, uh, they're not missing anything or suddenly need their help. But um, you will then just head on with your dive, really. Just follow the dive guide or go and do your own thing. At the end of your dive, send up a DSMB before your safety stop and the rib will see it and they'll then kind of hover around just to uh, pick you up after the dive. 
Take off your weight belt and hand that up first, then take your BCD off and hand that up to, um, to the boat handler. And then holding onto the side of the tenders, holding onto that rope, kind of time it with the waves and the movement of the boat and just swim like mad with your fins and uh, try to turn so that you're now kind of sitting on the side of the rib facing outwards with your feet out. You can then get back into the boat much easier. It's a bit more graceful than the sort of the beached whale approach. When you get back to the main boat, take note of your maximum depth and how much air you have left in your tank because you'll need to fill this out in the boat's logbook uh, as well as your own logbook. Wash down any sensitive kit like your computer and your regulators with some fresh water and sit your tank back in your space uh, sort of where, where you've been allocated. Underneath that uh, will be a little box. It's usually a kind of plastic crate, which is all yours. So you can keep all of your stuff neat and tidy uh, inside of it. But when you're breaking your kit down, just depressurize your regulators and then just take the first stage off of the tank. That's all. You don't have to take the BCD off or anything. You can leave that in place. Um, with the regulator off of that um, cylinder, that is the signal to the crew that your tank needs filling up. Their signal to you that your tank is nice and full will be some kind of electrical tape or some kind of dust camp over the tank valve to let you know that they've been there and they've topped up your tank. Okay, but what do you need to bring on a liverboard? You should really bring as much as you can. So bring your mask, your fins, your regulators, BCD, dive computer, um, but also your torch and also a DSMB and a reel or a spool with it. Um, it's now kind of expected that at least one member of every buddy pair brings a surface marker boy with them on every single dive for safety. So if you have one, don't leave it behind because they are quite essential and you have to pay to rent one. On a lot of itineraries, you'll also be doing a lot of night dives or just wreck penetrations or even some kind of swim throughs. So it's smart to bring your own torch on a dive as well. They will have rental torches and DSMBs, but um, you of course have to pay for them and the torches are usually about as bright as a match is underwater. So if you have your own dive torch, it's definitely worth bringing along with you. Get your gear checked over before your dive trip if you can, um, just to make sure it's all in perfect working order. Swap over any batteries um, because the last place that you want to run out of power is in the middle of the ocean where there are no spare batteries. Um, and bring along any kind of spare parts and kind of basic tools that you can think of. If something breaks and you don't have a spare part, that can kind of be it for you. Depending on the water temperature, of course, bring a wetsuit, um, but if the waters are warm enough that you don't need any kind of neoprene, then try and wear a rash vest instead of just an old dive shirt um, because they're usually far better for you because the material will often have a UPF rating uh, compared to a standard T-shirt. So with a rash vest, you actually don't need to wear suntan lotion, um, which can actually be harmful to the reef. And if you can bring two rash vests, uh, if you're diving multiple times, uh, sort of three, four times a day, it actually gives one of them a chance to kind of dry in between your dives so you don't have to put on a cold, wet rash vest uh, for your second dive. Other than that, um, that's about all you really need. You, your basic scuba diving setup, a torch, a DSMB and a spool and a rash vest. Um, and then just anything more specialist to the itinerary that you're doing. But um, if you have it, try and bring it along with you. But that's the easy list, all your scuba diving equipment. What else do you need for in between the dives? You know, the boring bit, your surface interval. You don't need to bring a great deal of stuff outside of diving gear, to be honest. I mean, from head to toe, a sun hat can be a good idea, um, something fairly secure, uh, because it can get fairly windy out there on the open ocean. From my experience, the crew probably would turn the entire ship around if your hat blew overboard, um, but I wouldn't test that theory, to be honest. Um, if you're doing a bit of rib diving, then something to cover the top of your head can be a good idea to bring with you on 
the dive, just stow it away in a pocket because you can be waiting on the surface for quite some time and the top of your head is fairly exposed out there. Sunglasses are a good idea. Again, you're pretty exposed. I wouldn't take them on the dive, but um, just sort of up on the sort of top deck or even anywhere else, you, there's a lot of sun kind of beaming down on you usually, and it is important to protect your eyes from the sun. Uh, clothing. Don't go too crazy on clothing. It's usually pretty chilled out on board and most people are just in board shorts and t-shirts. Uh, you don't wear shoes on board, so don't worry about those. Just bring what you need for the airport and for the final night in town. Um, personally, I mainly bring, I don't know, four, maybe five t-shirts because you can always kind of wash them in between. Uh, a couple half decent shirts, uh, sort of one for the flight in, uh, one for the sort of final night and the flight out so it's fresh about three pairs of board shorts because they're always getting washed as soon as you go in for a dive uh, and a couple of decent shorts again for the flight back out your last night is usually back in port uh, so you can get a taxi into town so it can be nice to have some fresh clothes for that and of course the final flight back home but i wouldn't worry about dressing up on board uh, very few people do other than that, bring a good book to read or even a bad book to read. You will have plenty of downtime, so it's nice to catch up with a good book. Um, if you're into your uh, your photography or your videos, then it's good to um, sort of bring a laptop or um, some kind of means to download your photos because your SD cards, they'll fill up pretty quickly. And uh, that day after your SD card is full and you don't want to delete anything off of it, will be the day that a whale shark just pops around for a visit. Um, and you can also download your dives from your dive computer um, so they don't uh, sort of back up. If you have a um, certain dive computers, they don't have that much memory, so it's quite good to um, sort of download the digital version as soon as you can. A lot of um, dive computers nowadays, they just have Bluetooth and they go to your phone. Um, but if you have a more, not vintage, but a, a, a more standard dive computer uh, you might have a, a usb cable so you have to plug it into a laptop um, other handy items include a, a big clip of some kind one of those big like s binders they're quite handy um, and clothes pegs as well your clothes and towel can get wet i mean everything tends to get fairly wet on a dive boat uh, and the best place to dry them off is on one of the rails on the side but uh, if you don't have a decent clip to uh, sort of clip it onto you can really easily uh, sort of lose stuff Bring along any relevant cert cards, uh, usually just your highest core cert card, so like advanced or rescue or whatever, and uh, any relevant specialities like nitrox, but I wouldn't bring every single cert card you have under the sun. Insurance information too, uh, they like that, and uh, of course bring your logbook so that you can uh, sort of write down your dives. As I said earlier, some dive computers, they only hold a handful of dives in their memory before they start to overwrite the oldest dive, so it's important to log your dives and do it as soon as possible because trying to remember the names of the dive sites as well can be really tricky. You're on sort of day five and you're trying to remember what dive site you did three days ago isn't the easiest. Um, it is great when you have that one person who's really diligent and has been doing their homework and writes down the name of all of their dive sites. But if liverboards are so great, do they have any downsides? There are some downsides to liverboards and it of course would be unfair for me just to skip them over. Um, so in the interest of balance, uh, the first one is, is that you'll be on the boat for five, day, five days straight at least. Um, apart from a really serious problem with the boat, um, any kind of medical problems or really bad weather, you will be stuck on that boat with the same group of people and fairly limited space. So if you don't socialize very well or if you're not going to get on with that other guest, um, you really need to be able to distance yourself so it doesn't become a problem. There are certain places where you can where you can hide away. Your cabin is usually a fairly safe space, uh, but it's not really the nicest place to uh, sort of spend your uh, your holiday. But um, there are places to kind of hide and separate yourselves if someone's going to be antagonistic. But um, but yeah, you are going to be on that boat with that group of people for five days so try and get along if you suffer from seasickness really badly then be aware that there can be some rough 
crossings. Uh, the captains and the crew are amazing, but uh, at some points they do just have to bite the bullet and just cross over some rough seas to get to your next dive site. So if you can't take too much of this, then try and ask the tour operator beforehand if the itinerary is known for being particularly rough in any areas. Even day-to-day -day life can be a little bit tricky at times. Walking around on a boat can be tricky because the boat will always be moving. Um, remember that you're not wearing any kind of footwear neither and um, on the inside they tend to be lacquered wood so it's really shiny um, so make sure that your feet are really really dry before you even go inside. They're lacquered even on the staircases so take care when moving around and again make sure that your feet are really dry. Most of the time uh, because the boats are so big they don't rock very much they're pretty stable but there will be some times where you do get some movement and that will be the time when you want to get somewhere else. You also can't leave any electrical items charging unattended and it's not great to plug in multiple items all at the same time. There have been some terrible fires on boats caused by electrical items faulting when they're charging up. So there are now only key areas where you can charge your bits up safely. Um, but if you have tons of rechargeable stuff, you kind of need to schedule them and uh, sort of make sure that they take turns so that you don't overload the electronics. So liverboards. Uh, uh, I mean, I love them to bits. They are a great way to really focus on your diving and see some amazing things, uh, but not the popular overcrowded dive sites. You get to explore more um, out of the way spots with uh, sort of more room to yourself. And um, there are far less hassle of breaking down your dive gear and carrying it backwards and forwards to the hotel at the end of the day. But what do you guys think? Are you tempted by liverboards? Uh, do you have any questions that might be holding you back if you do have any questions then of course let us know in the comments below thank you for watching as always don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to the scuba diver magazine channel and safe diving